Hey, welcome to the Backyard Professor live videos. Live videos. That sounds weird, doesn't it? Live. It's going to be videoed. I have again with me in this studio one of my very favorite people to host, Charlie Harrell. We are going to be talking in one of his chapters on the great apostasy, and Charlie has some truly spectacular information for us. We're going to do a deep dive into some scriptures, both the Old and the New Testaments. So let's get this road on the show and learn about why there wasn't a great apostasy as the church interprets it. That's right. You heard me right. There wasn't. We are going to expose the false narrative tonight. <laughs> So here we are. Let me first make a quick announcement and I'll uh, turn the time over to Charlie. I want to say welcome to all of the new viewers, our new subscribers, our new listeners. We also produce podcasts for your listening disastrous misery that you can listen to some of this stuff that we share with you. We like doing the live. We like doing the podcasts. We love doing the video recordings. I have done a couple of new video recordings just today <clears throat> responding to, or no, yesterday, I believe, uh, to Elder Jeffrey Holland on some of his ideas. And then I've just done a response video this afternoon on uh, President Russell M. Nelson's conference talk back in October 2022. Don't miss those. Um and so, as far as I know, I don't, I haven't heard of any real <clears throat> huge news in the church at the moment, except that I have Charlie Harrell on the show again. Hello, Charlie. Hello, Kerry. Good to be on again. It is great to see you. You look just as good as you did three months ago. What's your secret? I've hardly aged a bit, right? You haven't. You have not lost one hair or had one gray hair turn. Uh, that's good. <laughs> I've had two, and they were way back here, and I plucked them out. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that, though. I'm getting a receding hairline, which just horrifies me because I inherited my mom's hair. And Oh, boy. Oh, hey, by the way, also for the audience, tonight, sharpen up those delightful brains you guys have. We will be doing a question and answer session tonight. So Charlie's going to share his wonderful research for about an hour. And then we, and if you would, and, and remind me to remind them again too, Charlie, type all of your questions in capital letters once we get to the Q&A section, because I can't scroll back very easy to see all your questions. So don't ask them right now. Just write them down. Keep them in about an hour. We will entertain your question. Charlie will, because he is the man with the PhD brains on this subject, and he came loaded for bear. And I mean ancient cave bear, the ones that, that swamped the grizzly bears. So let me say hi real quick. Doug Vincent. Oh, look at that. That was good enough. I'm going to post that just for Charlie. 
Where'd it go? Here we go. Look at this, Charlie. They love you already. Charlie equals amazing. Oh, right. Doug Vincent, Patty Cake, Debbie Joe, Mark Crespin. Yeah, baby. Oh, I do that for you all the time, pal. And John Ross Barsky. And I saw Mo C. I saw Dan Vogel in here a minute ago. Welcome, Dan. Alan Young. Uh, who else? Mo C. and Mark Crespin. Newton Lemnos. Always good to see you. Gail Capson. Oh, Radio Free Mormon. Welcome, my friend. Got a lot of good people in the audience. We always do, Charlie. Uh, I know all these. Peter Higgs, yes. Um, these guys just absolutely loved our last show together. This time, we're not going to do uh, slides as such. We're going to put Charlie in the driver's seat, and we are going to let him rumble. For those of you who have his book, this is my doctrine. Now, listen, I gave you a heads up six weeks ago when I had Charlie on. If you haven't got it between now and then, that's your loss tonight because we're going straight out of this fantastic priesthood meeting manual for the Backyard Professor Lives. This is our manual. <laughs> Get this book. I promise you won't regret it. So, Charlie, the great apostasy. We all know James Talmud said it happened. We all know Elder B.H. Roberts said it happened. We all know Joseph Fielding Smith said it happened. What's your take on all of this? How do you approach this? It's a good question. Um, you know, as you're talking about uh, claims that it happened versus claims that it didn't happen, um, in the book, I take kind of a neutral stance, right? I say, you do. Here's what the data shows. I'm not saying that the apostasy didn't happen, but it didn't happen according to the narrative that has been developed in the church, in the in the LDS church. A very good distinction. Yes, sir. Yes. And that is how you, yeah, I didn't mean to <laughs> put implications on your fabulous read. That's true. That's why I love your book. You do that with every subject. Yeah. I skirt, sure. it, right? I, uh, take the neutral position. But uh, I think we do need to be careful. You know, it's part of being uh, humble about what we know and what we don't know. Um, we don't want to make claims that can't be uh, validated or substantiated. And uh, so that's what I'm careful not to do. So with that, should I start the ramble? I would love it. Love it. Yes. Okay. So in the book, uh, those of you who have looked at the table of contents, at least, you recognize that uh, the apostasy is the second chapter. And uh, some people might be surprised why I selected that as the first doctrinal topic. The introductory topic talks about, kind of frames the whole book by talking about the nature of scripture, the nature of revelation, of prophetic teachings, you know, what we uh, can and can't rely on necessarily. Um, so with that, I then dive into the apostasy because the apostasy and restoration really are the foundational ideas, concepts in the church. It's, it's the reason why the church exists. Um, without the apostasy and restoration, Mormonism really doesn't have a leg to stand on. Uh, so, and it acknowledges as much. Yeah. So with that, as we look at the apostasy, um, there is the narrative in the church today that is, it changes quite a bit, depending on who you talk to in terms of what the apostasy consists of, when it, when it took place, you know, did it take place uh, upon the death of the apostles or sometimes later in the third or fourth century? Uh, there's a lot of vagueness about what exactly occurred that created the apostasy. 
And that's for good reason, because we really don't have a historical record that documents the apostasy. Good so uh, in general, though, it's considered to be the loss of authority, the loss of the true church uh, sometime after the death of the apostles, generally. And it is believed that this condition prevailed on the earth until the time of Joseph Smith which is the reason for the restoration. So I think most of your listeners will have the, a similar experience that I had growing up in the church, where when we studied the Old Testament in seminary and, and religion classes and, and Sunday school, uh, the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, uh, for me, it seems like one of the themes that was harped on over and over, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, was the, the uh, prediction of an apostasy in the latter days or after the death of the apostles. So um, my takeaway when I studied the Old Testament was mainly that these Old Testament prophets foresaw our day. They prophesied of an apostasy, of a restoration, and the New Testament likewise foretold the apostasy, that it was occurring in the midst of the development and growth of the church within the New Testament times, and then finally came to a culmination with the complete loss of authority. So that was really drilled into... Uh, me at an early age, and I grew up understanding and indoctrinated with this apostasy and restoration narrative, like I think most of your listeners. Yeah. So the reality, though, as we examine scriptural passages which have been used to um, justify or to prove that an apostasy was to take place and that it was prophesied of in the Bible. As we look at these uh, passages in context and you know what they're what they're actually saying, there really is little evidence that the Bible gives us of an apostasy. And there's some very good reasons for that, as we'll see and as I talk about in the book. Um, so now, this is going to be interesting. Sorry to interrupt you, but this is going to be interesting because as, as so many of us know, both, both as elder Bednar calls us both the boys and the girls, <laughs> sorry, I'm not going to let him rest on that one. Uh, no, we actually learned these scriptures and taught them on our mission. And so this is what fascinates me about your analysis. So, yeah, good point as well. Uh, you know, I go back through, I, you know, I still remember the missionary discussions. And when we talked about the apostasy. and You had the flip charts too, didn't oh, you? Yeah. yeah, we had the flip charts, the, the, the flannel boards even. <laughs> um, and, you know, we would pull out those scriptural passages. We'd have... Uh, uh, Hermano Gomez, in my case, uh, I, I thought I was clever and I had them written down on the back as I was flipping through, uh, you know, thinking nobody caught me. <laughs> <laughs> that was smart. It was all I could do to stay is to stay awake uh, while my companion droned on. Where did you go? Uh, Mexico, Mexico, Mexico. Okay. Mexico. Yeah, I went to Missouri. All right, different place. Um, yeah. So it is interesting uh, just to acknowledge up front that um, we're going to look at some of these passages and many LDS scholars recognize that these passages have little to do with a prediction of an apostasy and restoration. Um, and what is very interesting to me is the... Um, publication or production of podcasts, of, of books, articles that try to situate 
the apostasy in a different way than what it, it has traditionally been situated as in the church. Mm -hmm. um, so we get uh, very interestingly back in 2012, there was a symposium at BYU on the apostasy. And it was very fascinating because scholars were brought in, LDS scholars from different parts of the country, some from BYU, and they spoke on the traditional narrative of the apostasy and how it developed in the modern church. And then they talked about how um, that narrative really is not supported by the texts and the historical record. Neither the scriptural text nor the historical record support that narrative. Was this published? It is. It's in a book called Standing Apart. If anybody uh, has a chance, or if you haven't heard of that, it's an excellent volume with uh, an anthology of all the different presentations uh, that were given at that time. Who edited it? Um, Miranda Wilcox and uh, John, I think it was John Smith or somebody like that. Um, so what I found interesting in that, I, was, I attended most of the sessions, but in the concluding session, uh, the academic, uh, there was a Q&A session at the end, and the academic vice president of BYU raised his hand and uh, asked the question, so are we to understand then that the only reason we know that there was an apostasy was because there was a restoration? And uh, pretty much that was, I mean, that was a huge kind of, well, <laughs> that was pretty much what we're saying. Oh, wow. Because there really is no basis for a belief in an apostasy, uh, the great apostasy as we have taught it, uh, other than the fact that there has been a restoration. Wow. Wow. Um, That's huge. That, that was huge. And, you know, since then, I think the Maxwell Institute uh, recently has even been involved in... Um, publications, presentations, yeah, trying, I forgot. To I forgot. Reframe, mm -hmm. trying to reframe the apostasy narrative so that it doesn't come across as vilifying the churches or you know, uh, basically acknowledging that they have a lot of truth, they have a lot of good things going for them. Yeah. Uh, we've been way too harsh on them. Uh, that way... And on Greek philosophy, too. Yeah. Right. They, they, so... Yeah. Even a lot of the early passages about, you know, our church, the, in section one, uh, the church being the only true and living church, or Joseph Smith's uh, account of the first vision where he said all the churches were an abomination. And, um, yeah, the, it's interesting how these are being reinterpreted um, to be much softer so that they don't appear as harsh and, uh, you know, to, to suggest that that isn't what was really meant at the time. But uh, I find that fascinating how the narrative shifts over time. Yeah. So with that in mind, um, traditionally, several passages have been used in the Old Testament to uh, prove that an apostasy and a restoration was to occur. And before examining a couple of these in the Old Testament, I think it's important to recognize a couple of points. One is that the predictive horizon of Old Testament prophets really didn't extend beyond their immediate time and place. You know, we like to think, and it's kind of a mythological view that we have of prophets that they see in crystal clarity the future. The reality is, and as most scholars would agree, biblical scholars, is that they had no idea about details or specific events in the future. When they prophesied, when they did prophesy in legitimate prophecies that weren't uh, 
prophecies ex eventu after the fact mm -hmm. that they were general uh, and that they generally um, address the consequences of transgression if uh, the Israelites, if the children of Israel didn't repent. So as most scholars would say that Old Testament prophets were more forth tellers than foretellers, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's one important con uh, point to recognize when delving into Old Testament texts and, and prophecies. Second, the Old Testament shows no awareness of Christ or Christ's church. Uh, there's no specific mention of Jesus or the mission that he would perform, nor is there any mention of his church that he would set up and important ordinances that he would uh, establish. Mm -hmm. So why would we think that Old Testament prophets would have knowledge of a universal apostasy from Christ's church? when they didn't even talk about it. It was not even, they weren't aware of that, even of existing. Well, they did. It was just lost out of the Bible, Charlie. That's right. That's right. So <laughs> those darn Bible manuscripts come forward and destroy a beautifully logical theory for Mormonism. Well, some of the plain and precious things that were removed, <laughs> right? Uh, a third point is that the worship practices in the Old Testament itself were nothing like what would be practiced in Christ church. Whoop. Hey, look at that. He's Hello. doing what I do. He's grabbing books off the bookshelf. Sorry. Had a call interruption. Oh, um, okay. I thought you was grabbing a book. I... I <laughs> That's not, unfortunately. Let me turn no, that no. Okay. Silence the phone. But when you think about it, uh, they didn't have any of the ordinances of the gospel in the Old Testament. They weren't practiced. Baptism, gift of the Holy Ghost, uh, certainly not the temple ordinances that we have today, like the endowment or temple marriage. So you know, to talk about, to assume then or presume that they would have foretold that these saving ordinances would be removed from the earth. I mean, it just, it, it just makes no sense when you think about it. Well, when I think when Mormons hear um, <clears throat> King Solomon's temple, and, and it's true magnificence, and those oxen on with the with the round basin on their backs, and then the the importance of coming back from the Babylonian captivity under Cyrus and rebuilding their temple. So obviously the temple ordinances were important to these people. That was the narrative I was raised with, exactly. right? Jesus visited the temple all the time. Yeah. He got mad. He threw the money changes out and all that because they were polluting the ordinances of the endowment. That's what I was told in cemetery class. <laughs> or cemetery <laughs> class. So, That's right. I was told the same not, thing. That narrative's yeah. not accurate. But it's there. So, so what happens is you try to find spots and places like... Uh, the uh, the laver or whatever it was called in the Old Testament, where they the priests washed to to purify themselves mm -hmm. so that they could minister. We we say, oh, well, that was the baptismal font. Uh, you know, it just totally it just boggles the mind that that these incidents and artifacts are stretched to fit the LDS narrative. Yeah. It's just amazing. Yeah, and, and they have to, Radio Free Mormon, since he's here in the audience, I'll give a shout out to him. He and I were talking once, and he, when we were discussing why aren't either one of us apologists anymore, uh, he actually published more than I did the show off, just like he produces more videos than I do. <laughs> but we were describing, discussing, we, we had to search so far and wide in so many different types of texts and stitch it all together to come up with with uh, you know 
the the hem of the pearl for the pre-existence and stuff like that that after sifting through 70,000 texts to find four parallels, you said, wait, we're leaving out 800,000 pages to find two paragraphs? Really? Yeah. That's what we do with this, with these ordinances in the Old Testament. And same thing with the apostasy. Yeah. And so when you talk about reading things out of context, you can find these little bits and pieces. But if you look at the surrounding context, and then the larger context that what are we even talking about? Ancient Israel had no notion of a church of Christ. And it's just, it's just so foreign. Okay. Now explain that. Explain that. What, what, ancient Israel had no concept of a church. Of Christ. Right. And that, that would be set up in Christ's day, say, and certainly not a church of Christ that modern LDS would define it as having uh, you know, 12 apostles and the, all the temple ordinances that we have today, uh, all the specific practices. It's just, it wasn't there. And it never has been. No. I, I mean, if it was, we would, we, you would think we would find it with, with some of the other uh, documents that have been discovered. Not that I'm saying archaeology is full and complete through the documents, but we, we've got some pretty good cross selections. You know, that was the, the issue with the farms apologetic. Once they, once they started finding parallels with the Babylonian temples and the, and the Sumerian temples and the Mesopotamian temples, and of course the Egyptian temples and so on and so forth, then absolutely everything in the scriptures became temple texts for about five years. It seemed like every time someone wrote an article, it was about being a temple text. So you could see that reading into it on full display. And you're saying that's probably what happened with the apostasy, with the use of the scriptures, with this subject on the apostasy as well. It because sure, sure seems so, doesn't it? It does, but then we have that anomaly again. I know I don't mean to take you off topic. I apologize. Oh, we're good. J Jesus is really thoroughly throughout the Book of Mormon that was supposed to be from 600 BC on, and that was supposed to be part of the restoration. Now you're going to get to that. I'm kind of jumping the gun, but anyway. Just, just to remind you, we want to, you, we want you to tell us that you, you have told me something about the Book of Mormon that is just delicious. I can't wait to get to it. So, okay, quit jumping the gun, Carrie. Keep going, Charlie. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> a couple passages then um, in the Old Testament. In, in the Old Testament, so okay. in, in general, when Old Testament prophets spoke of an apostasy, you know, they didn't use that term, but when they spoke of Israel black, uh, backsliding and uh, departing and, and being disobedient, they were talking about, the prophets were talking about and, and preaching to their own people. And it was about their uh, apostate, apostate situation mm -hmm. and that the Lord would no longer um, acknowledge them as his people if they continue to behave the way that they were. He wasn't, the prophets weren't talking about uh, a time two or 3,000 years in the future. It just makes no sense for one thing. And in the context, it's clear. Um, most of these prophets are given in the present, what we call prophecies are given in the present tense. The, the prophets are describing the current situation of ancient Israel. For example, Isaiah 24, 5. Um, right. Do you have that, Carrie? You want to read it? Isaiah 24, 5. It'll be the King James. Hope you don't mind. Sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This, this is famous. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws. They've changed the ordinance. They have broken the everlasting covenant. Right. And of course, that uh, phraseology appears in section one of the Doctrine and Covenants as being 
hey, here's the state of the world. This is why we had to restore the church. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, DNC 115. We won't read that, but um, no. it, it's restated there. Um, yes. So it's, it's interesting. I even thought when I was growing up that when it says they changed the ordinance, um, that that was talking about ordinances of the gospel, like, you know, baptism and gift of the Holy Ghost. But of course, the sprinkling. Yes. But in ancient Israel uh, and in the Old Testament in general, when the word ordinance is used, what does it mean, Kerry? I don't know. What does it mean, Charles? So when they talk about the ordinances, it was just simply the laws, the commandments, the the uh, um, the counsel that that God gave. That was the ordinances. I mean, just like today, huh. we have ordinances, right? As city ordinances, yeah. county ordinances. But we mean something different than they did then. Exactly. You know, we've changed the the meaning of ordinance has more. Oh, we're the ones ordinance. that change the ordinance. Oh, dang! <laughs> right, they changed the meaning. Uh oh, so, yeah, we're the ones that change the ordinance. Boy, there's a there's a twist of fate. <laughs> so, but anyway, and of course, the everlasting covenant. What could be referred to here other than the gospel of Jesus Christ, the everlasting covenant? Right. Right. So, what are you arguing about? Yeah. So, but in context and understanding the Old Testament history. Uh, the everlasting covenant was simply a another term for the law of Moses, which was understood to last forever. That's how it's described in Scripture in the Old Testament, in, in uh, uh, Exodus, Leviticus. It was to last forever as an everlasting or perpetual covenant uh, to remain throughout all generations. So that was the everlasting covenant. They didn't, they didn't have the gospel of Jesus Christ to refer to as an everlasting covenant. And so this is uh, what basically is being referred to. And yeah. so they're being reprimanded for violate for breaking the covenant because they were murdering. And it even, uh, if you read it in context and together with verse six, where it talks about uh, the murders and killing, that they had defiled the land by the murders they were committing. And that was the uh, conditions of the covenant. If they did that, they would be cursed. Interesting. So... Yeah. Anyway, that's that's one example. Another one that uh, we can briefly refer to, which is probably the most frequently cited, is Amos 8, 11 to 12. You want to hear something crazy? Yeah. I did I remember one thing from seminary. I remember the... And, and I am 62 years old, and I don't repeat this every year either, but I remember all of the Old Testament books in order. I'm there at Amos. Wow. That's impressive. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First Saint Samuel, First Saint Kings, First Saint Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. That is impressive. And then I've got John, Luke, Mark, and Matthew memorized in order too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, is that crazy or what? That is. That's that's bizarre. It's weird how the mind works. Okay, so Amos what? Eight what? Amos eight, eleven and twelve. Dude. Oh, look at that. Mark that's a missionary eight. scripture. Yes, yes. Can I read it out loud real quick? Please. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst of water but of hearing the words of the Lord. 
and they shall wander from sea to sea and from north even to the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. Okay. There you go. So what is this referring to? What, what's the uh, traditional interpretation? A famine of the gospel. It's going to disappear. It won't stay. They won't find it. They'll wander all over the earth and it won't be there. And they're seeking the word of the Lord, it says, and you shall not find it. So there, Mr. Harrell. There you go. Of the great apostasy right what there. What do you want? Now, when can we say your baptismal date? <laughs> so that's interesting, though. So, so what is this context? Because every missionary quoted that one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so interestingly, the scholarly interpretation um, based on the overall context and language, and here I even quote in my book, BYU Old Testament professor D. Kelly Ogden, um, and they all concur that it refers to the spiritual darkness of ancient Israel in consequence of their disobedience, that the fulfillment of this was imminent because... It was an obvious thing. They were disobedient. Uh, the Babylonian captivity had, had occurred, and, and now they're coming in to take Israel captive. And uh, this was in consequence of their disobedience. And so they were penalized with a famine in the land, a famine of hearing the word of the Lord because of that disobedience because they were taken away as captives by assyria and then later by babylon that's the context oh. here isn't it yeah that's amos's day we we like to imagine he had a telescope looking into the future 2500 years later i mean come yes. on nowadays that just seems so bizarre that i actually entertained that <laughs> well that's that's it's just amazing that we just assume these prophets were seeing our day in the minute detail. Well, it's our definition of prophets. Look, this Amos, I mean, he may as well have been Spencer W. Kimball. Spencer W. Kimball restored the blacks to the priesthood, the priesthood to the blacks. I mean, these guys were all of one cloth. You know, they saw back and forth in time. Yes. The, the univocal... Um, voice of prophets. We the, the gospel is the same yesterday because God's the same. The gospel is always the same. What mm -hmm. prophets teach today, it's the same thing that they taught and understood anciently, right? So those are some assumptions that if we're if we're stuck in that, then we'll try to torch the text to make it work in our favor. Well, let's move ahead to the New Testament. Unless you have any comments on... No, you keep right on trucking. I like Heather Reddick's comment. Wow, context is everything. It really is, isn't it? Sin sincerely, I I'm glad the audience is picking up on this because, you know, and who doesn't love to say, oh, well, you've got to keep the context more than Mormon missionaries? Right. Eight? We, is we, that we, we preach right? that, we say that's so important, and yet we're the biggest offenders of it. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, let's keep going. Now, I know most of your audience is familiar with, with these concepts and, and passages, so I hope they'll bear with it. I think it's important, though, and, and I think part of the, the interest I had in writing the book was to get into the, into the details. I didn't want to just say, oh, you know, Old Testament or the Bible didn't talk about an apostasy. I don't believe that. I wanted to get into the passages, you know, where, where do they sit? Where do you think they're talking about it? Right. And why does that hold up or not hold up? So moving to the New Testament, um, it also, like the Old Testament, it acknowledges that there were apostate conditions going on uh, from the earliest times of the church, of the New Testament church. Okay. But, 
in the broader context, so this is reading things in, a, in the broad context of the New Testament, you always find passages throughout too that speak of the persistence of the church through whatever rough times it's going to go through. So we're going to see that. In the New Testament? In the New Testament. So we'll see that in a minute, in a bit, because again, those are things, that's, that's context that gets filtered out when we look at some of these passages that we assume refer to the apostasy in isolation. So some key points about New Testament prophecies uh, of an apostasy uh, to keep in mind. One, Christ himself never organized a church, according to New Testament scholars. He was an apocalyptic prophet who anticipated God's immediately immediate uh, heavenly kingdom, right? He talked about, he prayed, thy right. kingdom come. I mean, that was his uh, main interest. Interesting. Um, in fact, he said that Jesus promised the heavenly kingdom, but what happened was the church. The kingdom didn't come, and... Because of that delay in the parousia that, uh, or coming of Christ, the uh, New Testament people and leaders had to kind of reevaluate Jesus' sayings as well as their own beliefs and start to think, well, maybe we're in here for the long haul, that he's not coming as soon as what we thought and what Jesus himself had led them to believe. That's a bombshell you're dropping here, Charlie. Okay, point two. There was no de two. There was no definitive set of beliefs that constituted primitive Christianity. That this idea of a pure primitive Christian religion is a mirage. It it never existed. Uh, that Bart Ehrman, uh, most of your readers are aware, he claims that even from the earliest beginning of Christianity. There were multiple Christians. In fact, he says that there was greater diversity in early Christianity than there is today in Christianity, which is, that's mind-boggling. Yeah. Elaine Pagels, too, says that. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, so just the notion that the pure primitive Christian faith was lost and in need of restoration is misguided because such a pure primitive Christian faith never existed in the first place. Mm -hmm. okay. So a third point to keep in mind is that changes to the early church organization and practices to adapt to changing circumstances can no more be taken as evidence of an apostasy than similar changes that occur in the LDS church today. Oh, Why but wait, is, wait a sec. Mm -hmm. When you change, it's apostasy. When we change, it's new revelation. Revelation, yes. Yes, well said. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's exactly how it's viewed, isn't it? It's isn't just like uh, the heretics, uh, the apostates are always the other guys, the other people, right? We're the yeah. orthodox faith. They're the heretics. Uh, that's what every group thought in Christ's day. Um. The um, fourth point is that there was no idea of a priesthood as a kind of independent authority that could have been lost. Jesus appointed individuals to assist him in his work, but no priesthood authority or conferral was ever mentioned in the New Testament. So the now, idea that... What about Hebrews? The, the Melchizedek. Yeah, what about it? It, it does talk about the Melchizedek priesthood. There is a priesthood. There is a priest, not a priesthood, but a priest uh, that arose from the order of Melchizedek or like Melchizedek. And who was that priest? Jesus. Jesus. What other priests are mentioned after that order? Um. Hold on, I'm receiving a revelation. <laughs> Something along Nelson, Russell M. Nelson, someone like that. Joseph Smith, aren't those guys in there somewhere? They've got to be. They're, they've got to be in the biblical manuscripts, right. Charlie. 
Hebrews chapter 110, maybe. <laughs> okay, so, you know, the, the idea wow. then that there was a loss was not even on their radar, a loss of priesthood, because why would they have prophesied that when there wasn't even such a notion that existed among them? Oh, great point. Uh, a fifth point. New Testament writers, like Old Testament writers, didn't see far enough beyond their own day to know whether a universal apostasy would occur. Again, when they spoke, they spoke of their own time, their own place. Uh, we, we look at even the book of Revelation, which we say, well, doesn't that prophesy for the next several thousand years? And it's interesting, in, even in that book, the angel commanded John not to even seal up the book because its time of fulfillment was imminent. Um, there was no long range forecast. Oh, the- wait, wait, that's important point. That Okay, now, so you're saying John's book, the angel told him don't seal up the book. That's right. It, it, it was... Just keep it open because this is here. That's this, right. is this is now. That's how you're interpreting it, right? Did I misunderstand that's, that? Oh, no, that's exactly it. That's an int- See, I haven't heard that from within Mormonism at all. Now, that's it because we like the idea of sealed books to be opened later, right? Right. Dispensation, seven dispensations, a thousand year periods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to have to go back and reread that. So, wow. I had never caught that. See, we've been so contexted within Mormonism. Uh, this is one of my fun joys of, of uh, interviewing with you scholars, you and James Tabor and, and uh, some of these people that are, yes, I've read the Bible, but with these proof texts from a Mormon interpretive view, when other scriptures are brought forward and put together or taken apart like you're doing or shown within context, uh, it just seems like an entirely new book. I, I've never heard that interpretation on the book of Revelation before. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, some things that we just have, we just have assumed, right? We've, we've been, it's tradition, you know, it's just ingrained in our mind. We don't, we don't, Stop to think otherwise. We don't step back and think, wait a minute, does this even make sense? And when you consider again the fact that New Testament writers thought they themselves were living in the last days, right? They thought oh. the second coming was imminent. Imminent. When you yes. read Revelation, the book of Revelation, in that context, then, well, of course, he's not talking about 2,000 years into the future. Um, <clears throat> Now, he does talk about the start of a millennial period, a thousand-year period. But again, that's that's something that he understood was going to be imminent um, in, in not some 2,000 years ahead of us. Ahead okay. of- I'm going to have to see some deep evidence of that. Let, 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 show me. Okay. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, but that that is a different interpretation than we've ever heard as Mormons. So I want to see one of your deep dives here because that's fascinating to me. Yeah, I, you know, I, uh, we talked about, um, there are numerous scriptural passages in the New Testament that Mm -hmm. indicate that the second coming was imminent, that it was just at the doorstep that this was the last day, that the end was near. And interestingly, you know, when we talk about the millennial period, that's only John. That's only in the book of Revelation. Um, Most of the New Testament has no concept of this uh, millennial uh, thousand-year period. It's Hmm. Christ is going to come. That's the end. The world is going to be you know, transformed. It's going to be the kingdom now of God permanently <coughs> on the earth. End of story. It's, it's, it's much closer to what the Old Testament view of the end times was. So, but what I'd like to do, Carrie, is, is 
delay talking oh. about some of the last day things until we get to the view of the millennium and second coming. Because oh, all right. yeah. it's all that good. just makes a much more impact there. But suffice it uh, to say for now that because the New Testament writers saw the second coming as an, an end of time immediate, immediately ahead of them, um, there was no room for an apostasy to take place and then followed by some way later restoration of the gospel. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to, though to get at were some of these other passages in the New Testament that give more of an impression that the kingdom is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. It's not oh. going to be lost. Uh, All right. You have to read any passage on the apostasy in balance with these other passages that talk about the persistence of the church. Uh, one of them, for example, Matthew 16, 18, that we're familiar with. We just had a comment come up asking about that. Good timing. Ooh, okay, okay, yeah, here we go, yeah. Okay, I see RFM referring to the 666. Yeah, it, it seemed like it was Newton Lemnos. Yeah, here we go. I just glanced at this. Thank you, Newton. We're not in the question and answer yet, but here we go. Please yeah, comment. So, Matthew so 16. It is interesting. In Matthew, I mentioned that Christ didn't organize a church, and here's Christ saying, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. There you go. It's interesting that uh, church is only used twice in the Gospels, one in Matthew 16 and in Matthew 18. And in Matthew 18, it's clearly just talking about um, the assembly in the sense of the congregation, the, the people, the followers, the disciples of Christ. Here is the only place where it could be read as an institutional church, although it's not required by the text. And most scholars, uh, by the way, believe that this is not an authentic saying of Jesus, that it was a later addition, redaction to the text, because it just does not fit anything else that Jesus taught. Um, I, so, I, have heard, I have heard it called a forgery. Yes. You, you're talking about the, the later edition because the earliest manuscripts truly don't have this. Um, this is one I've actually checked. The earliest manuscripts really don't have this. It blew my mind when I was researching this. So that's an important point. Yeah. Thank you for making it. It really that. is. And, and that is an important point to recognize when, you know, when, when I say, that New Testament writers and Old Testament writers didn't have any idea of the future in any kind of detail. Um, it's because a lot of them were writing after the events had already take, taken place, like the destruction of Jerusalem and so on. So it was easy to talk about uh, the destruction of these things. So anyway, the whatever whatever that passage might mean, whether... Uh, he, the church is going to be built on the rock. And I don't care whether it's a forgery or not. This was still part of the New Testament record. So it's, it's a passage that um, right. Latter-day Saints refer to often to justify things. And whether the rock refers to the church or to Revelation, it still says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That no power... Um, is going to destroy or overturn the guidance, the direction that the church is going to have or that revelation will continue to have uh, for the people. So, um, and interestingly, that's even used today in, in uh, the modern churches. That expression is the gates of hell shall not prevail against our church today. Yeah. Uh, another one to consider is uh, Christ's commission to his disciples in Matthew 28, 20. Again, we won't look this up in the interest of time, where he tells them to go preach the gospel to all nations. Again, this is also uh, believed to be possibly a later addition to the mm -hmm. text. 
But he says, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Um, now, this, this, this is another one that uh, Latter-day Saints, some scholars twist to say, oh, he meant the end of the dispensation or until the church, <laughs> until the church was taken from the earth. Um, but it's interesting, most modern um, uh, translations you say that he will be with his disciples to the end of time. You know, it's it's very clear in the context that he's talking about. Oh, no kidding. Oh, that's interesting. All time. I'll be darned. Wow. Well, and, and the most interesting passage in Matthew 13, which is the parable of the wheat and the tares. This is interesting because you remember that the householder... Um, the servants came to him and says, hey, we got tares growing among the wheat. We better destroy it. And the uh, household said, no, don't do that or you'll destroy the wheat. Let them grow together until the end. And then we'll pluck out the tares and, and burn them. And we'll save the wheat that way. The wheat won't be destroyed. So the whole message of the parable of the wheat and the tares is that the wheat isn't going anywhere. It's going to stay. You know, oh my gosh, Charlie, hold it. Wait. Think about say that, that. Say that again. I've not say okay, so the wheat and the tares. Yeah, he definitely says they will don't pluck it yet. Yes. Let it grow together until the end. Yeah. And then, but the wheat still that's right. That's right. Dude. I, yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of corruption in the church. There's a lot of wicked people. Let right. them continue there. I mean, that was the message. So, so their wicked people did not cause the apostasy. The wheat is still there. That's the message of the parable. In fact, uh, I have you, never seen it. I mean, it's right in front of our eyes, Charlie. Right. I've never thought right. about that. Oh, right. my God. Now, what, what really makes this interesting is that in DNC 86, that parable is re- configured so that um, the chair, the tares actually choke the wheat and drive the church into the wilderness, it says. So oh, it, it changes really? the storyline of the parable. God, 84 oh. is so blinker and long. I can't yeah, get yeah. 86. You can see 86.3. You don't have the you don't have the sections memorized like you do the Old Testament, do you? I don't. Let's hear you rattle off the sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, one, two, uh, 18, 27. <laughs> I knew you couldn't do it. <laughs> okay. okay, can I read this out loud just real quick? Oh, yeah, sure. The, you're you're really you get. I mean, the parables. Come on, how much have we talked about the parables in church? And it's. Yeah, then the parables of the, the, the testament seed, the leaven, and also in Matthew 13 convey the same idea of a gradual, uninterrupted growth and expansion until the end. Think about the the mustard seed wow. planted and it grows, right? And it, it and the birds land on it. I mean Such it's a like, simple thing, and I had see this. I should be embarrassed here, but yeah. this shows the brainwash. I have yeah. never heard that interpreted that way, but that's what the thing says. That's just what it says. The kingdom is like this. This is what it's like. This is how it's going to happen. Wow. So, okay, so after they had fallen asleep, the great persecutor, the church, the apostate, the whore, even Babylon, that makes all nations to drink her cup in those hearts of the enemy, even Satan, sitteth to reign. Behold, he soweth the tares, Wherefore, the tares choke the wheat and drive the church into the wilderness. Now, see, that's that changes, flips the whole parable upside down. I have and, never been shown this. Well, it's it's there, right? I, I mean, I did not expect to learn something new in the scripture like this, because that's so basic. Yeah. And yet, and yet we we have had. Wow. Yeah. But again, this is what has to happen. You have to 
you have to twist the scripture to say something else to preserve your narrative. If you believe that there was a great apostasy, you can't have this parable reading the way that it does. So let's change it. Okay, so just quickly, a few of the proof texts in the, uh, we said we're just going to go an hour here and our time's up. Uh, oh, it's, it's, it's all good. You keep going. We'll, we'll... Most of your audience, again, uh, your listeners are familiar with these passages. You've used them as missionaries. Uh, one of the, the common ones cited, Acts 20, 29 to 30, where Paul warns the elders at Ephesus, saying, after my departure shall grievous, grievous wolves enter among you, not sparing the flock, and also of your own selves shall men rise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. So when we're, I know, I know when I presented that, it was like the flock wasn't spared. They were all taken. The church was completely demolished. But that's not the scripture, is it? But that isn't, is it? Wow. And, and that doesn't, that isn't what not sparing means. If, if something, if, if uh, a tornado doesn't spare a village, it doesn't mean it completely wipes out the village. It means that it takes some of the houses. It takes a toll, but not necessarily a, a complete total toll. And here we're talking about the flock at Ephesus only, not the entire church. Oh. Dude, said, you are opening my eyes. And I'm so the elders at good. Ephesus. Yes. And then, and then we have Paul writing a letter later to Timothy at Ephesus saying that only, quote, some shall depart from the faith. So, and that's in Ephesians, you're saying? Oh, that's in First Timothy. Four, oh, no. oh, yeah, yeah, First, First Timothy. Timothy. Four, yeah. So Timothy was at Ephesus. Some was, shall depart from the faith. Yeah, some, not all, shall depart from the faith. So you know, we we just stretch over uh, reach with these scriptures to make a point, and uh, it's just. Not good reading of the text. Oh, you've convinced me tonight. This is uh, wow. <laughs> okay, another one. For my audience' sake, I'm not acting this out. Charlie and I did not talk about this beforehand. I had no idea he was going to pull this on me. I am. This is exciting. I'm going to do some study in here. This is great. Okay. Wow. We, we I, all I, need to. Look. Yeah, we all need to reread and reconsider. So one more that is probably the most uh, frequently cited passage in the New Testament for the apostasy, 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 to 3, let no man deceive you by any means for that day when Christ comes shall not come except there come a falling away or an apostasy first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. perdition. Yep. So, and that was the Pope according to McConkie. <laughs> I'm serious, yeah. really. I'm yes, serious. right. The man of sin, and uh, there, uh, there's, there's the there's a lot of different views of what that man of sin is. Uh, yeah, you mentioned it could be interpreted to mean whatever suits your narrative. Yep. Uh, but it doesn't mean that there's going to be a total all-out apostasy. I mean, it's not saying that at face value, right? It just says there is going to come a falling away. That means that some people are going to fall away um, and the man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, um, in context and the way scholars look at this is that this was already in progress. This was not something that was in the distant future. And that man of sin was likely somebody that was already alive at that time. Um, so in all of these, though, there is a, at most, all you can, um, draw from the scriptures is that there's some rebellion, some falling away, but never a total loss. There's never mentioned that there's a total 
loss or removal of the church or the priesthood from the earth. Of course, again, the notion of priesthood wasn't even there. Right. Um, so, and, and in all cases throughout the, the scriptures, there's always the encouragement of the righteous to continue to persevere, right? And that they would be preserved through their faithfulness because God is true to his people. He's going to protect them. Um, so let's jump just briefly to the Book of Mormon because that's a fascinating one. Okay. That's all right. um, if you think about it, what book would be more likely to talk about the apostasy than the Book of Mormon, which was the book that ushered in this dispensation to come forth as kind of a light in the darkness, to be this new revelation from God. A marvelous work and a wonder. A marvelous work and a wonder, yes. But uh, interestingly, and of course the background leading up to the Book of Mormon, we know that uh, Joseph Smith's parents, um, both of his grandfathers, uh, all argued that none of the existing churches was patterned after the original Church of Christ, that they had all gone astray. Uh, even Joseph Smith, in his earliest 1832 account, said that he had concluded that all the churches had apostatized, he said, from the true and living faith. And there was no society or denomination that built upon the gospel of Christ as recorded in the New Testament. Th those are his words. And I want you to notice the words that he used because he said the churches had apostatized from the true and living faith and there was no society or denomination that built upon the gospel of Jesus Christ as recorded in the New Testament. Notice he didn't say that there was no church who had authority to administer in the ordinances of God. Uh, that there was no church who who had all the ordinances that were needed for salvation. He just says that there wasn't any church built upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now that becomes significant. That's significant because that's the phraseology used in the Book of Mormon. That uh, a church is not Christ's church if it's not built upon His gospel. If it's built upon his gospel, it should have his name and be the Church of Christ. But And then what is the gospel in the Book of Mormon? Faith, repentance, baptism, gift of the Holy Ghost, right? Enduring to the end. That's it. That's the sum total of the gospel. That's the fullness there of the gospel. There are no temple ordinances in there, are there? None at all. That is what the Book of Mormon defines as the fullness of the gospel. So when you look at the Book of Mormon, when it talks about the time that it comes forth, and of course, uh, was it Moroni that said, I, I see your day, I know you're doing, you know, I, I can see perfectly the situation, the state of the world when this book comes forth. And yet what they say is that the situation, the state of the world, the state of uh, modern Christianity is terrible because one, of pride, wickedness, and corruption of the priests and, and teachers. They deny the spiritual gifts. That's a second um, deficiency. And three, they don't teach the fullness of the gospel. They don't teach the proper steps of the gospel. They, they mix them up. They don't, a lot of them were teaching in, in Joseph Smith's day that you get forgiveness of it. You got to repent, you get forgiveness, and then you're baptized. And the Book of Mormon's clear that no, you got to get baptized first, and then you receive a forgiveness of sins. Of course, that changes around in DNC 20 back to you have to demonstrate that you've received a forgiveness before you can be baptized. But um, that interesting. it's interesting that that's all the Book of Mormon says about the latter-day state of Christianity. It doesn't say that they, they wander hopelessly because they have no authority to act in my name. That's never mentioned. There is no mention of loss of priesthood in the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon does refer to the formation after the time of the apostles of a great and abominable church, right, in 1 Nephi 13. 
right. but, and that that church would oppose the church of the Lamb of God. But it's never, it is never suggested that the church of the Lamb would be taken from the earth. Only that in the latter days, its numbers would be few because of the wickedness and abominations of the whore who sat upon the many waters. Quoting from 1 Nephi 14, 2. So the Book of Mormon envisions two churches persisting through time here. The church of the Lamb of God and the church of the devil. So think about that. And and so when you I'm trying to wrap my mind around this because this is like nothing I have yeah. ever heard. And I've read that book dozens yeah. of times. Yeah, because we read it through the lens of the modern restoration that, oh, we know that there was an apostasy. So when this uh church of the devil rose, that must have been the end of the church of the Lamb of God. And you're but saying the Book of Mormon does not never say says that. that. Never says that. I'll have it, to go back it and assumes, read that. It assumes a persistence of the church until the end. And uh, if you look... in my mind here, Charlie. Yeah. So most significantly, nowhere does the Book of Mormon speak of priesthood authority and saving ordinances being lost or taken from the earth. And that would be very significant. I mean, if the Book of Mormon was coming to set things straight, it would say, hey, the first big mistake or the first major problem you have as a modern world, you don't have any priesthood authority. I can't even talk to you. You can't even get bapt uh, baptized legally. Um, when I say I can't talk, the Lord so, okay, wait. It wasn't Alma doing something about the authority of God when he was doing his baptisms, though? Am he I, was. Am I remembering that correctly? Yes, he was. How did he get that authority? From God. Okay. In, in some of these cases, like in Alma, um, it doesn't say where he got the authority. It just, uh, it's almost as though he assumed the authority or it's not handed down laying on of hands priest of authority though that these none well, of that's ever mentioned in the book of mormon is it there there are people who are set apart they're not given priesthood they are set apart to be teachers and priests priest, and people yeah. right priest. but there's never priesthood conferred on anybody in the book of mormon and sometimes it's just, you wonder, it's like they have uh, more of a charismatic authority that the Lord just directly gives them authority. But you notice yeah, everything. You're tougher than the Anna Mormons were on me. I, I did not know that either. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you notice in the Book of Mormon, all the miracles, everything that's performed is never by the authority of the priesthood. It's always by the power of the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost that gives power in the in the Book of Mormon. There is no priesthood power in the Book of Mormon. Priesthood is only an administrative um, sort of thing in the Book of Mormon. Okay, I, administrative I'm, authority. I'm honestly skeptical. You keep talking. You should be. I hope everybody is skeptical. I, I am. You keep talking. Okay, so. I want to just read a brief uh, part of a letter that Lucy Mack Smith wrote to her, uh, her, uh, her uh, brother, Solomon Mack, regarding what the Book of Mormon had to say about the state of Christianity at the time of its coming forth. Oh, and okay. Yeah, yeah. She says this. She writes, by reading the Book of Mormon, our eyes are opened that we see the situation in which the world now stands, that the eyes of the whole world are blinded, that the churches have all become corrupted. So there's corru there is corruption in the churches. Yea, every church upon the face of the earth, that the gospel of Christ is nowhere preached, meaning that gospel as contained in the Book of Mormon, faith, repentance, baptism. This is the situation which the world is in now. There are many who think it hard when we tell them that the churches have all become corrupted. 
but the Lord God hath spoken it, and who can deny his words? They are lifted up in the pride of their hearts and think more of adorning their fine sanctuaries than they do the poor and the needy. Um, and then she goes on and talks about, as a result of that, they don't have the gifts of the spirit that they had at the time of Christ. And that that was the promise Christ gave that these signs shall follow them that believe, right? Yeah. My uh -huh. name, they'll be able to do this not by any priesthood authority. So she's not saying that I learned from the Book of Mormon that nobody had authority from God to do anything, that we've lost the ordinances of salvation. No, it's simply that our teachings have become perverted and there's a lot of corruption and pride in the churches of the day. Uh, now, we skipped over the part in the pre-1830, pre-establishment uh, or organization of the church where Joseph Smith, uh, uh, the Lord told him, uh, I'm about to do a reformation, right? So there was an acknowledgement that the churches, none of the churches were, were denigrated initially. They were simply, the Lord simply told Joseph Smith that there's a lot of good people out there that my church, he says, I'm not, I'm not here to destroy my church. I'm here to build it up. In other words, my church already exists here. It wasn't until the church was established and start these narratives started to develop that all these other churches and all of the members were basically corrupt and, and not fit. Wow. So the Book of Mormon gives no prediction about the priesthood or church being taken from the earth, nor does it mention that important ordinances pertaining to salvation and exaltation, like temple ordinances, as you mentioned. No mention that they would be discontinued and in need of being restored. Rather, the Book of Mormon and other early Mormon teachings speak only of moral corruption and perversion of Christ's teachings, causing an exceeding many to stumble. That's First Nephi 13. Mm -hmm. A rejection of extraordinary outward gifts of the Spirit was also mentioned in the Book of Mormon. But, you know, what they warn, what Moroni, Moroni says is, you know, they deny these gifts. Why don't deny these gifts? Be open to that. That's true. Yeah. They it made wasn't it. That, well, you don't even have authority to have these gifts. So, um, but they the didn't appear to, so you're saying they didn't appear to worry about the authority to have the gifts at all anyway. It was just about who had it, who didn't. Uh, not authority, but who had the gifts and who didn't. Yeah, uh, right. That's what I mean. Who and, had the gifts? Who was, who was teaching the true gospel, the right, correct order, the five-finger exercise of, uh, um, what's his name? Um, Scott, Walter Scott. Um you had to, to follow that precise sequence. So the concept of loss of authority and need of having authority didn't develop until later. But prior to 1834, there was no mention of priesthood being taken from the earth or restored for that matter. Um, so that's going to yeah. happen yeah. later. Interesting. So, yeah. Later development. Yeah. I want to just cap it off. So the narrative... Uh, was embellished, right, of the apostasy to add the notion of authority, laws, ordinances, and so on. And that's the way it was taught up until um, the last couple decades, that not only was there corruption in the church and false teachers, uh, but they didn't have authority and um, the ordinances were gone. Nobody could perform those ordinances. Now, interestingly, as we talked about, you know, some of the intellectuals in the church and scholars are saying, eh, we've been too harsh on <laughs> Christianity. And there's really a lot of good in, good in these churches. And the people are great people. Some of them are way more Christian than we as Latter-day Saints are. So you have the um, reinterpretation of the apostasy narrative to where now, and I can I can tell you this is going to happen more and more in the church, 
apostasy is going to consist of no more than a loss of priesthood authority and those saving ordinances that people that other churches are not aware of today, like the endowment, yeah. temple marriage. Other than, that, that, yeah. other than that, we're fine with their Christian teachings. You know, they teach and follow the Savior's teachings about love and things more than most You're people. right. You're right. That's different than what you and I taught out in the mission field, man. It is. It is. Uh, that so, is seriously different. So it's really getting turned around, right? Where before the Book of Mormon was saying that, no, these churches are all corrupt. The members, the, the preachers, they're all full of pride. Um, mm -hmm. They all deny the gifts. Um, now we're saying, and, and the, no mention of priesthood authority. Now we're saying, hey, it's all just about priesthood authority. That's all we're, that's all we're saying. We're not saying you're abominable. Uh, we're saying that you are very Christ-like. You, your members are great. That you enjoy gifts of the Spirit, too. Um, we can't deny that. Well, they've even come to saying, yeah, well, Muhammad was a prophet to his people. I mean, I've seen Dan Peterson defend exactly. Muhammad vehemently online. He's the Islamic scholar out of farms and BYU. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that Zwingli and some of those other early ones, they were definitely receiving revelation from God to get the scripture printed. And they were definitely uh, prophets for their people, etc. Yeah, yeah, I have seen that that yeah. narrative being thrown in there now. Yeah. But but oftentimes they they pitch that only uh, to say that they had the spirit to help them lay the groundwork for the restoration, right? Right. right. But yeah. now people are being much more charitable. I think uh, members, some members, not all, and saying that. No, you don't have to have the gift of the Holy Ghost to enjoy spiritual gifts. We acknowledge. In fact, I quote in the last chapter of my book, um, I can't remember the the uh, oh, the BYU professor, religion professor, who was, I should look it up. He was. I got an epilogue. Who was it? He was a uh, former minister in, an, in a uh, Protestant Keller? church. Who? Keller? Keller, Keller, that's right. And he yeah. says, um, I, oh yeah, he says, um, the, the same gifts that yeah, we have, that I have here, I had in my former church. Yes, that's right. He yes, enjoyed yeah. the same gifts as he, uh, then as he does now. There's no difference, he says. There's, There's no, no difference. difference. Yeah, he does and, say that. And I so, can't find the exact quote, but I, I remember yeah. reading it. So there's becoming um, more and more a recognition, thankfully, which I applaud, that uh, these sure. other Christians, uh, members of other churches, really have a lot going for them. And so it's it's all this way, this attempt, and, and we read it in the latest book by uh, Patrick Mason on the Restoration. You know, it's not about the restoration of these truths and things and, and uh, gifts and powers uh, because you already have those. We're not, the church isn't about a restoration. All we restored really of significance, of importance at all, is just the authority. And that's just for us. So don't worry about these other churches. That's a huge change. It's really um, soft. Yeah. That this is nice to see, though. It is. It is. It's, it's, a, it's really. Great. Oh, I I applaud it. It's yeah, just I, that I would hope that they would recognize that they're reinterpreting the scriptures and reshaping the narrative and reinterpreting the scriptures to go along with this new narrative. This new narrative, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. It, it really is fascinating. Okay, you guys uh, in the audience, give us your questions. Uh, put them in caps, if you would. Put them in capital letters. Uh, we, we'll make a little bit of time for some question and answers. Uh, give us some of your questions on this. 
I, I'm blown away. I mean, seriously, you taught me something new tonight. I did not expect to get. Thank you. This has been spectacular for me. Usually I'm kind of on par with, with my guests and all, and you have just shown me some very cool stuff. You're going to make me go look into the scripture again. So does anybody yeah, have any questions? Hey, yeah. Let me mention, Carrie, I am no biblical scholar. I think that's obvious to anybody who reads my book. I quote biblical scholars. I have a high respect for biblical scholarship. Um, but I can tell you that anybody can pick up the scriptures like the Book of Mormon. And if you just disregard everything you've been taught about Mormonism and read the text for just what it says, ignoring your notions of apostasy, restoration narratives. Hard to do, though. It's surprising what stands out. And, and it just takes on a whole different meaning. I completely agree. It's wonderful. What a new light to look. Okay, Doug Vinson asks, what is the most egregious example of proof texting in the LDS church? Well, I'd say the great apostasy, but Charlie, that's your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, by this question, I take it, uh, Doug, that you're looking for a specific scripture. I suspect it's been taken out of context. Yeah. I love Doug because he likes the details too. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and one that uh, we're going to talk about next week because I think it's so, so fascinating is the one on the restoration of all things. Acts oh, 18, yeah. 20, uh, uh, that, uh, that, I can't remember whom the heavens must receive until the times of the restitution of all things spoken of by the, and we take that and say, there it is. The gospel, the church has to be restored before Christ comes. And it has nothing to do with the restoration of the church and gospel in the latter days. Or in Not day. only on apostasy, but when it specifically mentions a restoration, that has also been proof text. That yes. actually makes sense. Yes. Yeah. And we'll look at ways that that has been reinterpreted again to accommodate shifting narratives of restoration in the church. So see, the new revelation slash interpretation. Has, <laughs> that's, that's, instead of continuous revelation, we have continuous revision. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Okay, here is another one. Uh, now, this is from Ken's office, USA. Was Smith's view the same as others of his time? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a great question because in my book, um, I not only talk about Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, and then I don't jump directly into the first scriptural records of the latter days of, of the Restoration, but rather... What was the religious mindset of Joseph Smith's environment? And when you really look at that closely, and again, your readers are familiar with this, uh, and the answer to the question simply was yes. Initially, in particular, his view was no different than many of his day. Now, he didn't have the same view as everyone because there was a lot of diversity but he had a view that uh, comported very closely with the Methodist view. It was in what we call an Arminian view of salvation that required both works and faith. Um, that, uh, oh, in fact, even on the apostasy, primitivists were, were talking about the apostasy uh, for decades, if not centuries. And some of them viewed the apostasy as simply a loss of teachings and of um, conduct, like the Book of Mormon talks about. But also there were um, what would have been referred to as ethical primitive. Uh, those are ethical primitivists. Uh, there were also more ecclesiastical primitivists who believed that not only 
did uh, was there corruption in the churches, but there was a loss of authority and that the church had to be reestablished the way that Christ had set it up. So everybody was, uh, not everybody, but these primitivists were preaching and teaching the necessity of a restoration um, well before and, Joseph Smith's time. And, and uh, just last week, uh, Doug Vincent and I demonstrated, I believe with very dang good evidence, that the Erie Canal helped spread those ideas very easy mm. and quite speedy. They were available to Joseph Smith. No good question point. about that. So Good point. Very but, good. But consider the fact that initially Joseph uh, aligned more with that group of primitivists or that uh, primitivist belief that, hey, the only problem with Christianity is that we've, we've lost our way in the teachings, in our conduct. We need to improve. Um, it wasn't until later that he seemed to adopt a more ecclesiastical primitivist viewpoint. Very interesting. Okay. Here's another one for you. Curveball coming from our beloved patty cake. Does Charlie believe there was a complete apostasy? Okay. So here we come back to my initial statement that uh, I have to be agnostic, right? Because you can't prove that there was no apostasy you can't prove that there was an apostasy. Um, but even if there was an apostasy, I think the, the more significant question for the bigger picture is, so what? What does it mean? Right? There so, you go. so the church that Christ set up and taught was lost, that it... Uh, no longer existed in that form, hence an apostasy. So it's the Catholic Church and then later Protestantism, which are different forms of, of Christianity. So uh, to ask if I believe that there was a complete apostasy is uh, presupposes that I believe that there was a pure, primitive Christianity that existed in Christ's day, okay. and I don't believe that. Interesting. Okay, fair enough. Thank you for your question, Patty Cake. And thank you, Bob's business or Ken's office USA. Uh, Mosiah, Mosiah asks, please speak to how the church has changed their apostasy talk now. Um, that was basically your closing. Yeah, yeah. Kind yeah. of talked about that, that. Um, we remember I referred to that symposium at BYU as well on apostasy. Yeah, that and was so, fun. You know, that really kicked the ball, got the ball rolling. And now more and more, you don't hear this from the pulpit yet, right? Because they're behind 30 years of what the, the scholarship is. But um, more and more, what we're hearing is that the apostasy essentially consisted of a loss of priesthood authority to perform those necessary ordinances of salvation and exaltation. As far as gifts of the spirit, though, and you know, enjoying a spiritual life uh, of having moral, being able to have a moral character. Um, you know, I mean, really, you get down to the fundamental uh, doctrine of Mormonism that without the Holy Ghost, you can't do good. Uh, the Doctrine and Covenant says there's none that doeth good, right? Mm -hmm. uh, only those who follow the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. We would not say that anymore. That's that's harsh. So that's what's that's that's the most dramatic change in the narrative. We allow these other churches to be able to claim moral lives, spiritual lives, and uh, they're on their way to heaven, the kingdom of God. Um, but let's keep them in the lower levels, Charlie. But, uh, yeah, in the lower levels. 
They haven't well, had their second anointings yet. So, but even that is it's, kind of it's softening. Shifting. It's shifting. It's softening to where well, and you know that's just temporarily if they do because everybody will ultimately get exactly what they want anyway. Yeah, yeah. Here's a good one from our dear friend and fellow historian, Dan Vogel. Does Charlie recognize how angel ordination changed apostasy and restoration? Um, Do you know what he means by angel, angel ordination? You're, you're talking about, I'm assuming, Dan, the uh, uh, ordination by John the Baptist, Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. Yep. Later, yep. Moses. Well, made a big deal about this. He said, "No, that that doesn't happen. That that was that was some of the breakoffs from Joseph Smith. So this will be interesting." Yeah. So so it's almost too. I, you know, I, I almost feel like rephrasing the question to, uh, "Do I recognize how an evolving narrative of apostasy and restoration created?" a narrative of angel ordination. Ordination. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Maybe that's what Dan means. He'll uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. But yeah, the, I, they both kind of developed in parallel from, from the way I understand it. I know Dan has uh, a very detailed, precise uh, account of how the two uh, were synchronized and and how they developed. Uh -huh. but, uh, yeah, those. I do acknowledge that the angel ordination was something that was created. The the narrative. Uh, you know, I I agree with David yeah. Whitmer that uh, I never heard of any angel ordination when I was in the church. Um, I think he was telling the truth. That's fascinating, isn't it? Okay. Uh, okay. Here we go. Here's a question from my good friend, our good friend, I should say, Tim Rathbone. Which church survived Paul's or Peter's? Wow, that's an interesting question. <clears throat> Tim Rathbone strikes again, baby. Wow. Had him on the show, too. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Right individual. How do you know um, he had churches, Tim? Yeah. They might have um, been synagogues. Certainly, you know, most most scholars would agree that it wasn't Christ's church that um, survived for one simple reason. He didn't create a church. And everything that we have and that we draw about a church from the New Testament is drawn from the teaching of Paul primarily. So personally, it seems to me that it is Paul's idea of the church that survived to become the most prominent and i might be wrong but i i think i'm well i mean isn't isn't it paul that says and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some pastors and some teachers and evangelists so he is actually naming somewhat of the structure that mormons love to attach onto and say see we're just like the new testament church that yeah. was paul which, which is how we don't have a lot of Peter's writings, though, do we? That falls in more in line with just Christian tradition, doesn't it? Yeah. I, I yeah. think, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Now, the, now, the passage that you quoted, Carrie, is also an interesting one that we can get into when we talk about restoration is uh, half of those offices that, that are mentioned uh, in Paul, that's in Ephesians, which uh, may not have been written by Paul, but... Um, Right, right. We don't have those offices in the church today, um, technically, in, in the true sense. You're setting. getting harsh, Charlie. <laughs> and, and, you know, furthermore, those were gifts of the Spirit. He didn't say, what, what, that's an awkward phrase. He gave some apostles. apostles. What does that mean? What is, he gave who? He gave. He yeah. gave some what it, what it means is he gave some, in, he, it says that when Christ was ascended into heaven, he left spiritual gifts in the church. And some of these gifts, he gave some members to be apostles, pr 
prophets, pastors, teach. Those were spiritual gifts. They weren't necessarily priesthood offices. Very interesting. Yeah, we are going to have to have you back. And I, I have seen many, many comments saying, please have Charlie back. And that is in the works, I promise. Now, uh, here's the kick. Uh, I, I heard you say just a few minutes ago, and I've seen some comments that you, you're, you're talking. You say, yeah, we'll talk about that next week. And we will. But I have next Sunday another BYU scholar who has contacted me and wants to be on the show. And I will have you on the week after that. Is that okay? Not a problem. Okay, good. We are having Charlie back. There's no question. Uh, we're having Charlie back there. <laughs> this is way too much fun and enjoyable. Now see here, here's what's crazy, Charlie. I wanted to do this, uh, while I'm waiting for the next question, I'll ad lib a little bit. I've been wanting to do this New Testament commentary thing, and I just I haven't had time because I'm having so much fun doing my backyard professor responds, which I put up two new ones today, uh, this weekend anyway. And so, what you're doing tonight is just exactly what. <laughs> what I want with my New Testament commentary. So you're my New Testament commentator tonight for sure. Um, anybody else have any questions? Tim Rathbone says he agrees with you, by the way, just so you yeah. know. Good. That's pretty cool. I, oh. feel good. I feel like I'm in good. Here's Dan Vogel. No angel story created the whole church together and thwart usurpers. And that changed apostasy. That's how he's looking at this. The angel story created was created to hold the church together and thwart. Oh, yes, and thwart usurpers. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, that and, is, and uh, I think I actually mentioned that in the chapter on as part of the restoration that uh, even a BYU professor, a religion professor. Uh, not a technology and engineering guy, um, actually made that observation too, that those were crafted to um, assert Joseph Smith's authority in, in, uh, in the uh, face of uh, these usurpers. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and Dan is agreeing too. He said, yeah, this, this wasn't talked about. Uh, until 1835, and we, we now now it's really interesting because it took a uh, CES director um, Grant Palmer to actually finally. I know the Tanners talked about it. I, I get that, but they were so in the 60s and 70s, the church so dominated culture that they could just squash the Tanners metaphorically at least in my mind, so that they had me so terrified of looking at anti-Mormon literature that, you see, they dominated the narrative. They controlled it through labeling stuff. Uh, and now that Grant Palmer came and uh, brought out this idea of priesthood and weirdness of lateness and all that, then that has come out to the fore. And I know Radio Free Mormons in the audience and Bill Real and him have had sessions on this topic also. I just want to acknowledge that. So, uh, and, uh, yeah, they but, said a lot of good stuff. Oh, they, they are just my inspiration, even though I go off on my own quite a bit too. So any other questions, you guys? So we'll Carl, I notice I notice a lot of, uh, pushback on some things too, and that's good. I'm glad, glad. Wonderful. So not everybody agrees with everything I said, which is as it should be. That's so like, exactly I feel like we made some points because there's uh, some disagreement. Yes, absolutely. That is always wonderful and welcome on the Backyard Professor program because I love to see all the different views. We're not after the unification of belief. And we're not friends and enemies based on what we believe around this joint. We are all friends, and we are having a 
party well of a good time seeing other views and learning new angles. I, I have to confess, tonight is one of the first live sessions I have ever done so far in the year and a half I've been doing lives where I am actually learning something really new and interesting over old material that I have already read several times. And I am deeply impressed and grateful <laughs> for that. I mean, I've loved all of my lives. Let's not get that. Go. Okay. Uh, here we go. Let, let's look at Dan Vogel's comment. Cowdery published the first account of a angel ordination in 1834. There you go. That's the magical era, isn't it? The 1830s in letter to Missouri church. So again, it was later. Okay. They they were saying that happened in 1829, and it was later. Yeah, actually, Dan, uh, that that had to have been including Dan McClellan because at that point he was it at that point that McClellan was starting to get. Oh no no no, uh, he he got disgruntled with the Kirtland Temple, I believe that was 1835 or or, or uh, late post. When was the Kirtland Temple? 37, 38, something like that. That was when McClellan came out and started arguing against Orson Pratt and all those guys and Orson Hyde saying, come on, you know as well as I do, angels don't ordain priesthood and there's no such thing. None of us ever, David Whitmer never heard about these angels coming down. I didn't and so on and so forth. It's all bunk. So, yeah, and Dan says, yeah, yes, amen, Doug. Charlie is so knowledgeable. And uh, Dan Vogel says, good job, Charlie. And uh oh, Thanks. Is I have a lot of great resources to draw on, like Dan's resources. Excellent point. I He's do uh, say documents, you know, that lays out the whole sequence of events. Yes, fantastic stuff. Yep. Uh, so before we close out, thank you so much for all your awesome questions. Thank you for your wonderful participation. Uh, I've seen some new new names in the chat. Welcome, everybody, who are new. I've seen all my old friends and, and uh, GeoPlanet Jane. I didn't get a chance to say hi to you. Tom Miller, I didn't get a chance to say hi to you. So, oh, wait, wait. One more, if we could. Newton Lemnos, my friend from Brazil. So apostasy is created just to personalize an exclusive right to have religious authority? Interesting question. You, it is. You wonder what the what the motivation is um, behind it. You know, why did why was there the need to develop the apostasy narrative? Um, but then you also get this aspect of the the gradual acknowledgement in the church that maybe there wasn't an apostasy the way that we've thought that there has been. What implication does that have for the restoration that we're trying to justify using the narrative of an apostasy? So it gets to be kind Stick. of a, yeah, sticky, self-defeating. Excellent question, Newton. Yeah, that's a, that's a thought provoker. And we may very well be picking this up again when we talk about the restoration that I, I suspect we could easily find a way to uh, put that in. So, Patty Cake, appreciate you being here. There's a there's someone named Lo. Welcome. I haven't seen you here before. I apologize if you have been here before and haven't seen you. Heather Reddick, yes, we've said hi to you. I love saying hi toward as many as I can. Oh, toward civil literacy. Welcome. I appreciate you showing up. So anyway, so um, we, we've we gone our hour and a half plus a little over. Um, and thank you, everybody, for your questions and your participation. You've been having fun in chat. Uh, again, question. thank thank you, Charlie. Do you have any last uh, words you would like to say before we close out tonight? And No, this has been enjoyable. Um I uh, appreciate the, the questions and the comments. Um, just, you know, there's a lot of, of great thinkers out there and uh, just feel honored to be in your presence. 
thank you. We are the ones that are honored to have your presence, and we will be getting back together. What we're going to do, uh, we're going to go through Charlie's. For those of you who have this book, lucky you. Oh, and I want to hold it upside down. I put you on your head here, Charlie. This yeah. is my doctrine, the development of Mormon theology. Truly. For those of you who still have the jacket cover. Yeah, he's got the jacket cover. That's <laughs> my, I, don't, I don't know where mine went. Yes, uh, truly, truly a delightful book. You really need to get this book. It is one of the great reference books because of the way uh, Dr. Harrell has laid out the comparison contrasts with the different epoch of times and the different religious versions, ideas, and themes, and the comparison contrast with the scholars versus the theologians, not in a way of trying to make one correct, one false, but to show the varying approaches, my very favorite kind of way to study. This book has it all, sincerely. Uh, I'm sure you can get it on Amazon. Did they ever put this in paperback, Charlie? Um, I think they did do a limited printing in paperback. You can get it on Kindle or uh, the hardback. Oh, Kindle. I, I think the paperback might be out. I, I don't recall. That won't surprise me. It's a fabulous book. So if you can get it, even, even on Kindle, that's a great way to have books. I love my Kindle. So, so sensational. So thank you all for joining us at the Backyard Professor Live. We will be returning with yet again next week, this BYU scholar. I'm not going to reveal who it is just yet. I'll put it up on the announcements here after after Wednesday night's Mormonism Live, I usually try to get the announcements up on Thursday, but I have yet another BYU scholar, and this fine gentleman has contacted me wanting to talk on the show, and he is demonstrating how the Jewish understanding of the New Testament has been completely misunderstood by Mormons. So that's going to be a great show, too. Then Charlie and I will be back here, and we will discuss the fantastic Chapter 3 on the Restoration. You won't want to miss these. So love you guys all. Be good. Do well. Have fun. Thanks. Come again, and we will catch up to you soon. <laughs>